The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, in partnership with Kiwi Bank, the bank for Kiwi looking to get ahead in business and in life, a bank that delivers expertise and banking know-how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business or diversify, a bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose, Kiwi making Kiwi better off. I want to tell you about slightly stressful time in my life when I had to do some things I wasn't really comfortable doing where the weight of responsibility really dragged me down. It made the muscles in my neck hurt. I was a director of a company once and I realised once I was there that I had some particular responsibilities I'd never had to think about as either a manager of people or as an employer and that is keeping my staff as a director, safe in the workplace. Now, for me, that meant um, ensuring that the journalists, you know, weren't going into war zones <laughs> without the right protection and that sort of thing. And it was it was quite remote. You know, there was the obvious issues like making sure that the carpets weren't going to make you trip down the stairs. But uh, it made me think quite a bit about my responsibilities and the risks as a director and a manager in keeping people safe. Because under the new occupational health and safety rules that came in a few years ago, directors are personally responsible if someone has an accident or gets sick on their watch. They could go to jail. I could have gone to jail if I had uh, created an unsafe workplace. And something to think about as a director. And in the end, um, there are a bunch of reasons I decided to stop being a director and the muscles in my neck don't have so much anymore. The reason I talk about this is because right now, New Zealand is in one of those moments where directors, managers, business owners all around the country, it's suddenly dawning on them, they have to make sure their workplace is safe from a deadly disease. Not just the people in their workplace and themselves, but obviously their customers and their suppliers and all of those people they interact with day in, day out. Because the government at the moment has delegated the responsibility for ensuring as many people as possible are vaccinated to businesses. They are the middleman, if you like, in this great contest we've got going on between the freedoms of individuals and the freedom of society. Now, it's not often we're in a position where a very personal choice that you make to literally stick a needle into your arm and inject some sort of foreign fluid in there, which you have to believe is safe. And of course, we all know that these uh, vaccines are safe and we should all be vaccinated. But for a bunch of people, sadly, because of the malign influence of a whole bunch of people and systems and social media, actually don't believe they're safe and are not just uh, hesitant, although most most of those people who are um, not having the vaccine are hesitant rather than outright opposing. But there's a significant proportion. In fact, right at the start of COVID, uh, it was in the 30 to 40% range. The latest surveys show it's closer to 20%, but we now know because of Delta that's not enough. When you look at what's happening in Israel and the likes of Iceland as well, Israel got its vaccination rate with Pfizer up to over 80%. They were one of the first to get it. In fact, they did a deal with Pfizer to get the vaccine uh, to their population as a bit of a guinea pig. And when they got to 80%, they decided to open up because they thought they'd get something like herd immunity. Well, the problem with Delta and the way that the vaccines work is that it stops you, of course, from getting hospitalised most of the time, although there are some breakthrough infections. 
but it doesn't stop you from passing it on, and particularly to passing it on to people who are unvaccinated. So you've got this really interesting problem now, where if you have an unvaccinated staff member, and someone else on the staff who is vaccinated but catches COVID and passes it on to them, you have an event that you could have managed, which has created you know a potentially lethal situation. You're responsible. This is business managers, directors becoming responsible for trying to keep society safe. And so we have to work out where does that line get drawn and who does the line drawing? And at the moment, we're making it up as we go along. Understandably, this thing's come out of left field. It takes a while to get a piece of legislation through a select committee process. But we may have to do things rather quickly this time because right now we've got this pressing issue. We must, must get our vaccination rates up, you know, not just 90%, but 95%. We have to use all of the levers to ensure that as many people get vaccinated as possible. But we have to do it, in theory, without using the law to force people to do it. Because at the moment, uh, vaccination is not something that it is, you know, illegal not to be vaccinated. Uh, And pretty much everyone around the world has tried to avoid this in any sort of broad, blunt way. And certainly the government has been very reluctant to, you know, go all nanny state on it and force through um, mandatory vaccinations. But I think they're going to have to get there at some point. And what's interesting about this week's podcast is we've discovered from talking to Kirk Hope, the CEO of Business New Zealand, that businesses right now are thinking, how do we ensure we get the vaccination rates high? And how do we get some help, some air cover from government in particular, to ensure that those people who are a little bit reluctant, who you know can't be convinced that, that vaccines are safe, that they now know that it is illegal not to be vaccinated in that workplace. So at the moment, overseas, uh, we're seeing um, vaccination mandates being passed by parliaments and governments or set by regulation by governments. In New Zealand, there is no mandate for vaccinating in the health workforce. We talked to Francis Hughes, who is the clinical director at Oceania Healthcare, one of the biggest retirement home and aged care centres in the country. 4,000 units it has and nearly 3,000 staff. And they've had to deal with this issue right from the start of COVID, ensuring that people wear all the right masks and PPE and before the age of vaccinations, making sure that you knew um, who they were living with, travelling with, whether they were going overseas, not going overseas. And now, once we have the vaccinations, knowing whether or not they're vaccinated. Oceania, right from the start, was very adamant about ensuring people knew that if they were new employees, they had to get vaccinated. Because remember, the law says you can't retroactively write into an employment agreement that vaccination is compulsory. So what's happening is that new employment agreements include the clause about being vaccinated, but the old ones don't. And of course, for most people, it's not a matter of just ripping up the old employment agreement and putting in a new one. You actually have to have a negotiation, have a discussion. And it's not easy because right now we're in the middle of, you could say it's a societal democratic experiment about how to delineate the line between individual freedoms and societal freedoms and responsibilities. At the moment, it's businesses and directors who are having to draw that line at some risk to themselves and to their staff. It would be quite nice if the government helped them out and did the job of governments, which is to come up with a set of rules we all agree so that people can have personal freedoms, but at the same time not use those freedoms to hurt everyone else and make sure that society is as functional and safe and and happy as we can possibly make it. Delta is effectively challenging our status quo on how we draw that line. It's time we drew the line and helped out those in business who are at the moment amateur line drawers and uh, wondering how they can ensure that from a society's point of view, we reach those targets of 95, 100% for vaccination. I'm Bernard Hickey. That's this week on When the Facts Change, a podcast on the Spinoff Podcast Network brought to you in partnership with Kiwi Bank.
Well, kia ora, and welcome to When the Facts Change to Kirk Hope, the CEO of Business New Zealand. Kirk, great to have you on the show again. Thanks, Bennett. Yeah, good to be here. So tell us, what are your members having to deal with at the moment as we start to roll out this vaccination program? Yeah, uh, look, there's a range of things that they're having to think about. So at the start of COVID, uh, you might recall there was quite a lot of talk about vaccination and what the requirements, what the legal obligations for employers and employees were likely to be. Um, the government has always kind of maintained a consistent line that they want it to be voluntary, that, you know, that their preferred um, processes for it to be voluntary. And um, by and large, that's how they're planning on getting, you know, 80 odd percent of the vac- uh, population vaccinated. For workplaces, it's, it's, it's more problematic because there are health and safety risks, obviously. And we've seen um, cohorts of people, uh, for example, at the border or essential workers um, who might, uh, might be at higher levels of risk if they're unvaccinated. That's a proof point, if you like, for an employer to be able to say, actually, we can't have you in this role unvaccinated. And, and so there, is, there have been some uh, examples of that. Uh, so what tends, has tended to happen with those people is if there is a role available that um, doesn't expose them to COVID and they wish to remain unvaccinated, they can, they're, they're often redeployed into those roles. And so, so businesses have to really think about kind of how much scope they have to be able to do some of these things. Um, and, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about a small business that might be exposed to the border, uh, they, they, they won't have very much scope at all. So, you know, they'll be trying to encourage um, their staff to get vaccinated and, and have their teams encouraging each other to get vaccinated for, for obviously for workplace reasons, for family reasons, uh, particularly where there's a high level of exposure. So, I mean, some of that stuff is actually reasonably clear cut. There's, there's case law on it, so on and so forth. One, one, one thing that Michael Wood, the, the Minister for Workplace Relations, has said is that new contracts may require, uh, may be able to um, require um, staff to be vaccinated. And I think, you know, we're very supportive of that. Um, but there will be a large cohort of existing employment contracts out there where, you know, if people push back and say, actually, we don't want to be vaccinated, we don't want this to be part of our employment relationship, and it's none of your business employer, there's not very much that employer can do about it. I do think um, there's going to be as we've seen in other jurisdictions, Bernard, I think there's probably going to be some challenges um, for people wanting to do certain things if they are unvaccinated. Um, you know, even even pubs and cafes in some parts of Europe and the UK are saying, if you can't prove you're vaccinated, you're not coming into our premises. Um, so there will, there will be some, potentially, some sort of uh, restrictions for people who, who choose to remain unvaccinated. I think that will come about as a result of some of those other things that I just talked about, people people not wanting to put their own staff at risk or their other customers at risk and, and so on and so forth. Do you think we can get over 80%, you know, even over 90% where many of the um, epidemiologists seem to think we need to be? And even then, we're probably not safe from outbreaks. Uh, should the government be looking at more robust, you know, mandatory, some sort of legal action to ensure people are vaccinated um, as workers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, it's a really, my my natural response would be, look, yes, <laughs> but but I think that's a really difficult one for a government. And also there will be populations and, and communities who don't necessarily react that well to being told that they, they must do something. It's, um, there, there will be uh, people who don't re- react that well, let, let alone communities. Um, so I think, you know, the, the first port of call is really utilising education, f- getting as many facts out there about the costs versus the benefits of getting of being vaccinated, or the benefits versus the cost of being vaccinated, um, and the risks, um, and trying to get as much information to as many people as possible uh, about why they should be vaccinated is, is a really imp- important first call. I do think that there is an argument, and quite a strong argument, that if there are businesses which, you know, are quite important for the economy, but not necessarily essential, but important important for economic activity to keep occurring, um, so let's just say, you know, they're a big part of the industry that they're in, let's say above 50% from a production perspective, there might be an argument for them to... Uh, for the government to mandate some of those businesses to to have a fully inv- fully vaccinated workforce because of the kick on implications for other parts of the economy if they if they are not operating. So if you had a big factory that produced you know seventy percent of New Zealand's something or other, and that got taken out, uh, you know that has a big economic um, and health 
you know, it has a big health consequence, but it has a big economic consequence as well. Because if the government mandated it, that would make it easier for businesses. They could then say to their workers, well, we had no choice. This was a government thing. You have to do it. What, what they would say is actually this business is important enough that we would like to mandate it um, because it has flow-on effects for so many other people within within society and, and the economy if if this activity is not going on so many other jobs are you know are affected um, there's not going to be a huge number of those businesses but I, I think there'll be enough of them because New Zealand is you know it's a it's a kind of economy that's made up of some very large players and then a long tail of, of much smaller players so if you take out some of those big players in certain sectors um, you, you know you'll have a really, really big impact on, on a lot of those small players as well and the employment that goes on there. So I think there is an argument for it. And, and as you point out, um, that makes it easy for the employer to say, hey, um, not our call, you've got to get vaccinated, we're important enough um, as, as a part of the economy. Is that something some of those businesses or Business New Zealand have gone to the government and said, we think these are the essential big businesses that need to be have the help of mandation? Yeah, we, we haven't yet. Um, and again, you know, there's, this has got a, a little way to play out. Um, and I think what, what everyone is looking for is, uh, you know, a well-educated population that understands the, the benefits of being vaccinated and does it anyway before you have to mandate. I mean, I think mandating is, a, is, a, is, is probably a, a last call. So managers are responsible to shareholders and report to directors. Uh, directors have particular responsibilities under the health and safety regulations to make sure they look after the health and safety of their staff while they're working for them. How does that play into um, the decisions that directors and managers will have to make? Because on the face of it, if someone comes in who isn't vaccinated, they could spread it to other staff who are vaccinated and make them sick. Um, surely under the health and safety rules, if you're not going to breach your requirements as a director, you have to exclude the people who are not vaccinated. Yeah, and, and I guess the question is, you know, how much of a, you know, how much is the risk of exposure? And I guess the, if you think about where we've come from in terms of COVID-19, from, you know, the original virus to the Delta variant, which is much more transmissible, there's probably a much stronger ar argument with Delta to say, actually, we uh, we need all our staff to be vaccinated, irrespective of what their, what their job or their role is, um, because there's more likelihood of exposure and transmission. Um, so I think I think the case has got stronger for for employers to say this um, uh, on a, on a health and safety basis. But if you think about back to the, you know, the original virus, um, that was it was probably much. A much weaker case because um, it was less transmissible. There were other things that you could do um, to protect uh, workers, and it was really at the kind of at the at the boundaries where you know there was high levels of risk. You know, MIQ and border and um, and essential workers, uh, healthcare, and so on. But there, this could be solved for those people who are on new employment contracts. What are you seeing around the new employment contracts that are being written up and whether, you know, the, um, the, the, the um, boilerplate contracts that are out there are starting to change? Well, rather than boilerplate, I mean, because there are just a, a very broad range of employment contracts that are out there, um, I, I think that businesses will particularly public-facing businesses. If you think about, let's just take the case of hospitality, um, who, you know, they've been hammered by COVID, let's face it. Um, so they'll, they'll have a really tough choice to make coming out of, you know, this uh, lockdown. And that is to say, we can ask our customers to be vaccinated or we can ask our staff to be vaccinated, right? Um, or both. Um, for our staff, it's it's easier because, you know, there is a higher level of risk, they're public facing. Um, it, but it is, it's also a really tough situation for an employer to be in because, you know, they still have to say to their, gonna have to say to their customers, you might need to be vaccinated to come on our premises. Um, e even though um, Delta has made it probably clearer, it's, it's no less of an easy situation for them to be in. And what about the, the issues around mask wearing, all the sort of PPE stuff, you know? Um, it's, it's very clear if you're in a hospital, of course, but in various places, it's quite possible under, you know, whatever the base level becomes, whether it becomes level two or whatever, that 
you know, mask wearing will become a thing, particularly in indoors. Um, how, how are employers approaching that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, broadly supportive of, um, you know, the the mandatory masking stuff that has has been implemented. Um, I think I think if if it's a choice between closing your premises or asking people to wear masks, um, it's it's you know it's a no brainer really. And, and so the the question really will be to ensure that there are adequate supplies of PPE um, for if if everyone has to start wearing masks. Um, and I think you know we've seen the population get, you know people get generally more comfortable with it. If, if you travel anywhere in Asia, you know it's a it's a it's 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 already part of an ingrained part of the culture, and it will probably become something like that for New Zealand if we want to minimise the risks and maximise our you know our kind of activities. Um, so I do think it's it's going to become um, much more normalised than we might have seen in the past. And on the issue of misinformation, you talked about it earlier, and obviously um, it's best for everyone if um, people don't believe the misinformation or don't see it. Or don't spread <laughs> um, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there's that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what what um, role could uh, businesses take to um, try to either combat it or to stop it spreading? Because in theory, businesses are able to, you know, turn off Facebook on computer systems that they control and various other things. Yeah, actually, um, so a couple of points there, uh, Bernard. Um, really early on, we recognised the, that there was likely to be uh, misinformation circulating and we asked um, the Ministry of Health to put together, you know, some really good material for workplaces. Um, so it's important that, for, it was important for us that um, that information about the vaccine came from a source of truth and I think, you know, that, that the Ministry of Health is a source of truth. I mean, um, although, again, people who are spreading misinformation would say, you know, they're a source of truth, but not our source of truth. Um, uh, but so, which is quite frustrating. But for workplaces, it was important, you know, to get that information from the Ministry of Health around the, you know, the benefits, the costs, the risks and so on, and, and get it into workplaces so that conversations could um, start to happen um, between employees as opposed to employer, employee, manager, employee, but um, within groups of people starting to talk about it and starting to look um, at a more factual basis and, and to have that in the workplace um, so that employers could be contributing uh, uh, to to a better fact base in, in kind of trying to, um, I, I guess, combat misinformation to the greatest extent possible. There's a bit of a debate developing around um, fast testing, um, antigen testing, the PCR testing, the sort of off-the-shelf stuff that the Brits have got. What's your view on, on, on businesses getting involved in the testing, fast testing game? Yeah, lots and lots of businesses. Oh, first, firstly, I'll just say that I, I, I think generally it's been really disappointing um, in terms of, I think, the Ministry of Health's perspective on a range of these tests. Um, we haven't got a lot of them in New Zealand. But really, I, I would my argument would be, why wouldn't we have all of that stuff available for people to be able to use? They're just layers of protection. Um, and so it's really frustrating, I think, when you look at um, what's available for... Um, businesses in other parts of the world. I know that there are a lot of businesses, uh, particularly with those that are at the border who are using, they use nasal pharyngeal testing, uh, but they also use saliva testing because you can do it more regularly. It's it's way um, less invasive for people who have to have regular tests. So it is a bit frustrating and, and uh, you know, I really think that's an area where, where we don't want to fall behind. And on the issue of um, employers actually... Uh, helping the vaccination program by particularly the big employers. You know, if you've got a thousand staff turning up uh, one day, you're in a great position to give them all a jab. <laughs> what What are some of the big employers doing? Because I know that there is a program for some of the big employers to help um, with the vaccination program. Yeah, um, it, it's not it's not always that as easy as um, you might think for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, you're not always going to get a, a, as many people as you think in those in those workplaces at all at one time because of you know shifts and still keeping operating and then kind of people having to take time out after they've been vaccinated. So um, look, that program has been rolled. Well, it was in the process of being rolled out before we 
got into lockdown. Um, I think around 60 large organisations had, had been successful in their expressions of interest. Um, the pilot was run with um, four large organisations, Main Freight, uh, Fonterra, um, the Warehouse Group and Fish and Pikeville Healthcare. And there were a lot of learnings that were um, captured by the Ministry of Health to enable and facilitate and assist um, some of those businesses that were successful in terms of their expression of interest. Um, you know, I think the key thing is for, for employers uh, that are involved, you know, they'll be able to do it at scale. It's really important. But as I say, you know, if you think about the number of workplaces, 60, that tells you that in order to be successful, you need to do this at scale. And there's, you know, so there's only very limited numbers of businesses that can have the capacity to be able to do that at scale. I know that the ministry were looking at groups of businesses that might have been, say, in a CBD locality um, that might have been able to band together uh, as well um, to, to get more people in a particular place uh, to to get vaccinated. I think the, you know, my, my observation would be that, that there are probably some other more... Um, more effective and efficient mechanisms, you know, if you think about the, um, notwithstanding the public transport issue, but the, you know, the mass vaccination at, out in the stadium. And, and similarly, uh, the drive-through vaccination facility that's running out of Auckland Airport um, and the park and ride um, there, uh, you know, a lot of people going through there, very easy. Um, so it's just, it's just about getting this done is about scale and it's, it's about getting those areas that can really um, serve that scale. Park and jab and ride. Sounds good. <laughs> um, on the issue of incentives and punishments, overseas, to get the vaccination up high, everyone's throwing everything at it. Overseas, you've got some people being paid little bonuses if they get vaccinated. Um, in some places in America where health insurance is an issue, people are having to pay more for their health insurance if they don't get vaccinated. What's, uh, what's the sort of best practice or how people are dealing with that here? Yeah, look, a lot of employers, um, you know, to go back to our earlier conversation about kind of um, rather than compulsion, you know, how you can incentivise. And so employers are certainly looking at that, um, you know, giving their staff uh, time off to go and get vaccinated. That's quite an important part of it. Um, and then incentivising them to do so by, you know, providing vouchers or money um, or a range of other incentives, travel, transport, so on and so forth. And just finally, you know, we're having this debate about elimination and uh, what sorts of decisions we make once we get to a level of, of vaccination that we're happy with. Um, what's your view on how quickly uh, and what sort of opening up, if any, we can have next year? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I think if we get to, you know, 80% 80, 80 of the population vaccinated, um, I would like to think that we were still able to to look at um, that risk managed process for border opening. I, I think, you know, the general population might be reluctant to have a, a free for all. And, you know, that's not what the government were looking at when they announced the reconnecting uh, New Zealand to the world strategy. And, and so I think it's important that, uh, A, that we, we, we do start to open the door um, safely, and we saw that with the Trans Tasman bubble. I think you know clearly the levels of vaccination are, uh, are going to be conclusive about how far the door opens, if you like. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think New Zealanders, as they see also other parts of the world and what they are able, what they're doing, and the freedoms that you know they're starting to have post vaccination. You know, I think people will say actually we we kind of need to move on from from the fortress New Zealand. And is there a role for businesses to effectively help get that vaccination rate up as high as absolutely possible and in return, if you like, get some more freedoms? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think as we've discussed, it's, uh, you know, all of the businesses that we've talked to are, are really keen to help their employees to get vaccinated and to help them understand the risks. And if they are hesitant um, understand why they're hesitant and see if they can address some of those hesitancy issues. Um, so there's absolutely a role uh, for businesses. And and actually, I think, if, you know, if you're talking to a lot of large businesses, their, their probably perspective would be that rather than mandating it, you know, they want to be able to work with their people to be able to, to go through that process 
to demonstrate um, a that they're a good employer that that they want to do the right thing uh, they want to help people understand how to how to do the right thing with the vaccination um, so uh, so I think um, there is as I said a, a pretty significant role for employers to play from a leadership perspective as well as from a you know on operational um, getting the jab perspective Kirk Hope the CEO of Business New Zealand Kirk thank you very much for being on when the facts change pleasure thanks Bennett after the break, we'll be talking to Francis Hughes, who is the clinical director at Oceania Healthcare, to find out how someone working at the coalface, the really dangerous coalface, has been dealing with this issue of how to get as many people vaccinated as fast as possible, as simply as possible. When the Facts Change is brought to you in partnership with KiwiBank to help you understand the issues affecting the economy. And that's what their team of experts is here to do too. Here's Kiwi Bank economist Sabrina Delgado on what's happening with the labour market in Aotearoa. Our slowing economy gives way to higher unemployment and we're seeing tightness in the labour market quickly abating. Both a recovery on the supply side with our surging migration, boosting labour supply and loosening some very tight labour market conditions. But now a stronger narrative is coming through. As consumer demand cools, so too is the demand for labour. Firms are no longer hiring with the same gusto. Already, unemployment has started to lift from record lows and we expect that to continue throughout 2024. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to stay up to date with detailed economic analysis and forecasts from Sabrina and other KiwiBank experts. They take big issues from both here and overseas and make them relevant to Kiwi businesses. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. Francis Hughes is the clinical director of Oceania Healthcare. It's one of New Zealand's largest retirement home and aged care operators. They have nearly 4,000 units and nearly 3,000 staff. And as the clinical director, she's actually in the senior management team and is there to ensure that everyone is safe and that the care for not just customers, or the uh, aged people in their homes, but also the staff are safe. And right from the start of covid the aged care homes have been at the front line of the battle. I asked her, what did Oceania do in those early days to ensure their policies and everything was going as they hoped for? Because it wasn't a simple process. Yeah, I think um, I think the last year we played to our strengths. Um, we always knew that we were strong in care and got a great group of managers who are managing our facilities, great deal of strength and clinical provision. We were creative, learnt to be more innovative, adapted early, became very agile in use of technology. And also we have got um, and were able to harness some very strong relationships across the sector, which allowed us to lobby um, and to be also to influence nationally as well. So we are part of, you know, the 670 providers in aged care in New Zealand and also part of the New Zealand Aged Care Association and also the Retirement Village Association. So being able to leverage within those organisations and at times we led within those organisations with uh, putting uh, changes um, and leading some key pieces of work with the ministry and the DHBs allowed us to bring our, our business to the fore and just show how strong we were when, you know, when we entered covid there was the impression that, you know, aged care was just going to be, you know, a, 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 a lot of mortuaries around the country like it was overseas. But, um, you know, we were very strong and we've well connected um, and worked across commercially sensitive com- competitors. We were working well with them 
on key strategic things that help the whole. And we all got pulled up by that. So what sort of things in particular did you have to work with the ministries and the government to ensure um, that your places were safe? Well, I think there was a lot of the advice they were giving was not contextualised. So they made assumptions. And, you know, um, science um, is at times a, is not as pure art. So applying public health knowledge of hospital systems to an aged care facility where it is people's homes is really important to understand where we're dealing with people whose families are crucially important to them so we had to develop we developed an ethical framework for decision making so that we could make sure that there was hard decisions had to be made but we were constantly balancing what was been the ministry was asking us to do we were pushing back um, on about screening tools, around testing. So we were the first to come out with saliva testing. We've been doing it for a year for all our screening for all our staff. We put we push back on some of the issues around um, admissions and still doing this to this day around making sure that we could keep open for business, but we had negative testing done. You know, we locked down early, we made sure our staff were being looked after, did lots of pastoral care, which we're still doing now. You know, we want staff needed to come to work. We want to make sure they had babysitters for their children. We want to make sure they had accommodation. We want to make sure they they had food on the table. So they were, you know, their paychecks were, you know, there was all these systems and processes, which you have in a normal business but which when times when you need to keep going and you need essential workers to turn, you actually have to step up and step into it and create the value for them to get out of bed every morning and keep coming to work, knowing that they're going to work in PPE, um, knowing that they are, you know, every time, um, you know, someone comes in or out, that our exposure to our business was through visitors and through our staff. Um, so we had to, and constantly dealing with the human side of it. You know, people died in our facilities. They died naturally and they weren't going to die alone. So we pushed back on some of the advice that said, you know, you're not to have visitors, you're not to do this. And we constantly contextualised that. We worked and developed good assessment with health and safety. Health and safety uh, was a crucial part of the business, but it's not, it, again, it's got to be interactive and it's got to be agile and it's got to be able to do risk assessment. So we did a lot more risk assessments than having hard and fast rules. Yeah, a lot of businesses are now um, in the unusual situation of having to think about uh, having staff that are vaccinated, having staff that aren't vaccinated. We came out really early on that. Oceania came out really early. We did a lot of policy work earlier this year. We had good, uh, we did good immunisation policies. We said, you know, we absolutely respect people's rights, but we also have to maintain safety for our people and our residents. So we put in a whole lot of procedures. We work really close with our, you know, we've got a great strength in people and culture um, in Oceania. And we did um, a lot of work with our managers, having talks, dealing with hesitancy, giving information, having lots of videos. We had our Director of Education and Research, who's a clinical pharmacologist, um, doing one-to-one -one talks to staff, understanding about the virus, understanding about the vac vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, um, did a lot of early work, and that has paid off. But at the end of the day, we said very clearly, all new employees will be vaccinated. That was the first. Secondly, if you choose not to be vaccinated, and you're an existing employee, we're going to put you into a mask and do surveillance testing on you. And that will be there as long as you work for us. So um, what have you found, uh, having done all that work, um, in terms of uh, how many people have decided not to uh, have a vaccine or um, maybe initially were reluctant and then decided that it was okay? I've, I function as a, of a group general manager level, but also I'm the clinical director. So I had, I've had three or four calls on the, even when we were, um, before we got to level four in Auckland, um, I made myself available to talk to people, to say, look, you know, this is why, this, so people just need to be, have the door open for them. There is so much garbage of information out there. And, um, you know, you've got to be able to just can't, you just can't leave people and say, oh, look, they're not going to get vaccinated. 
there's p- reasons why people don't get vaccinated and a lot of it's got to do with fear and anxiety. So you've got to get down to that level and you've got to be open and you've got to be upfront with them, transparent and send them to the right information. And yes, so we've had some of our staff who were pregnant who didn't want to get vaccinated earlier on, they've now come in and that's the ministry's advice. We've had other staff who have said, look, I just waited, I wanted to wait, uh, but that's fine. We just need you to pop your mask, keep a mask on while you're, while you're there. This is before level four, of course, because everyone's in masks now. But So it is about actually get, leaning into them but sometimes you've got your anti-vaxxers and, you know, and then there is a different issue. That's a different issue. And health professionals, their regulatory bodies, um, for the nurses, their regulatory bodies come out very strong. There's no tolerance really for anti-vaxxers amongst nurses. We have had to have some um, quite strong discussions with people and some people have left our, our, our employment. Can you can you say how many? Because you've got a lot of staff. Um, oh, uh, you know, it'd be less. It'd be less than a handful. But I think at all times you just got to make sure that you're doing as much as you can to address the issues, and that's that's about being a good employer, isn't it? You know, you can't you can't you're not out to change their mind. You're just making sure that they understand that and they have access to information and they have opportunity to talk it through. And 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 sometimes you know. Is, you're not going to be able to work in health in the future without being vaccinated. And I, I think that's a reality. And I, I do wish the government would come out stronger th- on this, to be honest, because it would help, it would help us. But, but, you know, overseas, there's little to no tolerance of this. So what could the government do to be clearer on this? I think they need to mandate that for all healthcare workers need to be vaccinated. Um, I just think it clears the pitch. It's, it's, an, it's a no-brainer. It's... it's um, the exposure of, you know, when you are in the front line as healthcare workers, um, and I'm not saying other essential workers aren't in the same boat, but my, my industry is health, um, where you are protecting um, and caring for vulnerable populations, which you are when you're working front line in health and aged care we are, um, I think um, you've just got to, the reality is that um, vaccination is the one of the biggest tools we've got for protection of this virus. And we don't want um, our staff and our residents exposed. We know there's less transmission of the virus when you're vaccinated. So it's another tool in the toolbox. We've spent a lot of time with a great, our great health and safety team um, develop, developing up the bow tie methodology, which is you have one side of it, which is all the internal controls you put on to prevent and the middle bit of the tie is the actual happening. You have exposure or you have COVID. And the other side of the tie is all the things you do to manage it. So we've spent a lot of time understanding all the facets of how we can prevent this coming into our environment. Surveillance testing, good access to PPE, fantastic education and engaged staff, really good, strong systems and policies and following through on the policies. And, you know, investing in our leadership management of our great uh, managers in our facilities. So what sort of um, policies and systems do you think could be useful for those businesses who previously, they're not in healthcare, they haven't had to think about this sort of stuff before, and now they're in the process of going, gee, I'm going to have to make sure that everyone wears a mask and I have to do some fast testing and that sort of thing. What, What sort of policies and systems could they use? Well, if you're not in the healthcare arena, you've got to have, you've got to get your health and safety policies sorted out. So this is the well, this is staff well-being. Um, this is where it interfaces with people and culture and normal business practices. Um, things around vulnerable staff assessments, um, knowing your staff, knowing declarations. You know, getting getting those process. We've spent a lot of time getting declarations, knowing who staff were living with, whether they lived with border workers, whether they lived with people who were flying in and out on aeroplanes, et cetera, et cetera. And it's particularly important for new migrant staff that are coming in because they're not aware of the New Zealand system. So good onboarding um, and good um, orientation uh, and particularly then looking at how you protect. So health and safety would be 
the cornerstone of this with people and culture in most businesses. And then in the clinical world, we have really strong clinical infection control policies and public health kind of things come in. But your basic business, which should be really strong health, good health and safety and good people management. So um, for a lot of other businesses, they're having to think about um, uh, doing vaccinations of their staff and then setting themselves up afterwards to have lots of, you know, mask wearing and various other things. Some big companies are actually doing the vaccination programs themselves. How do you think other big companies should do it? What, what's been your experience? I, look, I've, the more we can get back staff to vaccinate, the better. Some of the hesitancy is about not knowing where to go, not wanting to queue, not 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 that's not is not um, culturally they don't feel safe in some of these environments. It's not languages that they understand. So, you know, vaccinations are key. Now we're not we're not doing all our own. We are we've got trained vaccinators in our in our. So we I'm a trained vaccinator, and we've got lots of trained vac- vaccinators in aged care in our facilities. And they go. They work with the teams that come into our facilities to vaccinate our residents. We are offering dedicated vaccination um, pop-ups, really, for staff and their families. We want their families vaccinated. And I can't. This is the importance of understanding your people. That you know, the people that they live with every day in their bubble need to be protected by them. But also, we want to be protected through through the vaccine through them as well, because every layer out you go is another bit of exposure. So, offering those and getting pop ups, working with a pharmacy chain or working with um, a DHB, getting as many people through and making it as easy as possible. I was vaccinating last this earlier this week. We did a pop up. I had grandma, grandpa, fourteen year olds, our staff members, their mother. We had whole generations. Now, half of that family did not speak English, but it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. They felt safe. They came through. There was no big long queues, and they all came through because of what Oceania did. And on the issue of fast testing, there's been some debate about, um, you know, how quickly the government has been about allowing people to get, um, you know, off-the-shelf testing to do things at home or in, in the workplace. What's your view on that? The main thing for me around the different types of tests, is that there is a clear guidance and protocols that go along with that. People understand what to do with them and what to, that happens if they happen to get a positive. That is a clear chain of, of action and, and decision-making that occurs. The other issue is I think we've got to allow more private labs to do more. The, our labs are absolutely stretched. We've got to get tests that aren't so reliant on some of the the facilities we've got or that we've got better technology that can get better, bigger volumes through. Is, is that because the, um, the ministry or the DHBs have concentrated everything on one testing system? Why can't they use lots more? I think um, it's a complex issue. I think it's to do with the current systems that are in the labs um, and also, you've got to realise you've got to have lab staff. You know, we've got we've got essential skill shortages in New Zealand, and and the lab staff are working. Lab technicians and people in the labs are working really hard as well. So, did we ever think we'd be doing this amount of testing? Did we plan? You know, there really needs to be better workforce planning uh, at, at, at an organisational level, at a business level, and at a national level. Because we've been caught by over reliance on overseas skilled workers because of the and now the borders, and we've been caught in nearly every industry of now having we've got really full employment in many areas, and we've got skill shortages. Francis, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time here on When the Facts Change. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network, together with Kiwi Bank. Visit KiwiBank.co.nz to find out how Kiwi Bank are making Kiwi better off. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.